my first question to all of you is, what do you think these curves represent? You can shout it out if you'd like to. Population growth are here. Adoption, pretty good. Anyone else? Yes, uh, adoption, yes. So, yes too, but they're also the way cancer grows, for example, and the way healthy gut bacteria grows. And what's not in that curve is the end of the curve, which means on the cancer, it actually will extract, extract, extract until it kills its host. And on the other hand, the gut bacteria optimizes for synergy. It makes the host live longer and healthier. But it's also the growth incentives that we deploy currently when we invest in companies um, and the natural growth curve of the services um, that they represent and will have. And there's a natural tension where um, at the root of the growth incentives that we have in our companies is that individual investors will have uncapped returns. This means their share price can have any arbitrary value. Of course, in a practical sense, maybe not, but theoretically. So what will happen is that those organizations and the shareholders will tendentiously maximize to uh, uh, have an incentive to maximize the value of that share, which means ultimately at some point it will hit against the natural growth curve of that service, um, meaning it will start extracting more and more. And ultimately we have all the crashes that we have all the time in our economy. So for me was the question, uh, or my research, how can make companies, or how can ha companies have the right incentives to grow a bit more like gut bacteria and have the capacity to regenerate and co-evolve with their ecosystem, while at the same time richly rewarding those people who put in the risk, money, and time to make these companies grow? And at the, at the root of this is how the question, how much is enough? So how, how can we introduce a cap in the individual investors' returns so that those organizations gain the economic freedom to internalize their externalities better. Because right now the problem is every dollar that we spend on, for example, improving supply chain sustainability, paying workers better, or more fairly distributing the profits that a company makes is ultimately going to hurt the bottom line of investors. So a bit of context of why I'm doing this. Um, I'm Oliver, I'm the co-creator of Memex, which is a personal and collaborative tool for online research, for basically collaboratively bookmarking, annotating, and discussing websites, papers, and videos. And for me, it was clear from the get-go that selling shares that give uncapped returns to investors is not the right model for us. And that is because the profit maximization incentives that it would create would lead us to uh, do things that are um, for example, creating lock-ins, so that means that we can continuously grow at a certain point. And this is what happened, for example, to tools like Twitter. Twitter, in the beginning, was a very open infrastructure. They had an API where you could build even alternative clients. But then at some point, in order to continuously grow, they needed to lock down their APIs, make it impossible to build those clients, and adopt business models that are, that are based on growth, basically ads. So, um, Idealism aside, the problem is also that a company like us probably needs something between one and 30, 50 million dollars in the first few years in order to get to the size that we want to be at. But the problem here is that pre-revenue, this type of money only really can come from venture type investments. But uh, VCs and angels won't invest if there is a cap because it inherently breaks the math. Right? Like, right now, an, a VC invests in 10 companies, one will fly really hard and pay out the entire fund. So if there's a cap, it doesn't work anymore. So in this talk, I'm gonna walk you through the things we tried to basically make it work. Like, how can we make the math work so that organizations can raise something between one and $50 million, uh, keep the cap, but make the math interesting for investors again? And a few design constraints to talk through. Uh, one is the company needs to have the economic freedom to regenerate. Second one is it needs to provide returns that are competitive to uncapped returns, so essentially making the math work out. Uh, the third one is to make it suitable to raise between one and 50 million, and it should be working for high growth companies. So the first thing we tried was a revenue share agreement. And a revenue share agreement is essentially saying, you invest 100,000, we might give you a 10x return, and we're gonna share a portion of our profits uh, to uh, 
basically pay back uh, this, uh, the debt that we have, that has accrued. The big problem of this model is, however, that it will funnel out a lot of growth capital in the first 10 years of that business operation and even beyond that this company needs to ultimately grow. The second problem is that funding is extremely expensive for the organization. At a 10x multiplier, which is already pretty high, and, but it's necessary to even make it mildly competitive to a VC-type investment, uh, a company needs for a $1 million investment make $200 million revenue. So obviously, uh, this is not feasible. And lastly, there's also the need for making a decision now about the future returns of, the comp of investors and team members, which makes it incompatible with the sense-making like, um, sense approach of investing in equity um, and knowing that, well, you don't need to make a decision now, it's actually gonna be uh, related to the performance of that company in the future, and we basically offload the responsibility to making that decision to the market. And this doesn't work with revenue share agreements. So this brings us to another approach, um, which is redeemable equity and tokens. And essentially it works at, uh, the following way. We can use equity now, and we, in the 10-year mark, or 15-year mark, it's, uh, it's really flexible in the end, uh, we can set a valuation of the company. And that valuation can be either really through sheer market price at that point in time, or it can be a self-valuation, and that's what we want to opt in for, is essentially figuring out what is the entire value that our company produces in the world. And that could be a function of, for example, a multiple of our revenue and profits, or a multi plus a multiplier based on how sustainable we are on an ecological basis or a social basis, and yeah, do a kind of a self-valuation. Um, at that point in time, the company would then regain or gain the right to redeem its own equity at that price. And this is how essentially the cap would be introduced and making it more performance-based than the revenue share agreements. Yeah, so to summarize here, for that model, um, it has the economic freedom to regenerate because it caps the returns. It gives the organization the growth capital it needs because it doesn't need to pay this money back in the first 10 years. However, the same problem about the cost of this model uh, are there. Uh, it will still cost just $200 million in, uh, in revenue in order to provide that million dollar in funding. And there's not even a team paid for that. Uh, and the second thing is that 10 years is still a long time. You still have the same risk than you have when you invest in a VC type, like with VC money. And it's also one of the reasons why VCs expect these high returns because they're locked in for these seven to 15 years until the exit of the company happens. And so for us the question was, how can we provide a liquidity and early profitability in the first 10 years as a new trade-off for investors to invest in these type of companies? And to solve this, um, we use a model called the rolling safe. And you might be familiar with a tool called Fairmint, which is a software that allows you to fundraise from your community um, with safe agreements, uh, the rolling safe agreements, but also with equity. We're particularly using the rolling safe. So what the rolling safe is doing is essentially creating a micro IPO inside the future equity of your company. And this, these, in this case, for example, we give out 20% of our future equity to all existing and future shareholders or stakeholders. And it's really important. What's gonna happen here is that um, if someone wants to invest after, say, the next round, and um, there is people who wanna sell their shares, they're first gonna buy out the existing shareholders who want to sell their shares. And only anything that goes beyond will be invested in the company. And what it will do then is essentially diluting the existing investor's shares while at the same time increase the issuance price of the tokens um, of, like, through a bonding curve. And through that, offer liquidity and profitability to those investors that have invested now and want to exit before the 10-year mark happens. And to give you a quick um, like example, and please don't quote me on this, this is just a ballpark numbers to get a feeling of how the, the dynamics would um, play out. Let's say there's a 500K round right now. And with those 500K, um, these 500K give you 2.5% two, two of the company. Um, you see, if we never raise another round, uh, if we make $100 million revenue, um, the, and say the company valuation was set at 5x the revenue, simplistically saying, uh, this means a, an investor could make a 14x return. 
If we're growing to the size of revenue that roughly Slack and MailChimp make, the investor could make 140x return. Now, if we were to raise an additional $20 million, the dilution would bring those 500k in shares down to 0.43%, um, and then also obviously decrease the, um, the, the, the conversion price in the end. So it incentivizes us also really strongly to be very mindful in raising extra money and not try to like raise for insane valuations just for the sake of it. So now, if we combine these two together, redeemable equity and a rolling safe, what it means is that again, the company has economic freedom to internalize its externalities. It is suitable for high growth companies. Now, it could provide competitive returns to VC by changing the ability of them having early liquidity, early profitability, but also less risk. And that less risk comes from, um, if our company is gonna be uh, valued by the value that we provide into the world, meaning our revenue and profitability, this means everyone knows we need to be profitable. Like we need to optimize our company for actually making this money. And as soon as we are a company that say, hopefully at some point make $100 million per year, then uh, the chances that we're not gonna be able to return that money, is just gonna massively reduce itself. So there is a less risk for the investor too. And lastly, and lastly uh, with this model, it's also potentially possible to raise these one to $50 million because now it's not anymore like every million that we raise, we'll need, we need to make $200 million more revenue. Every million that we raise is actually gonna get cheaper because it's always the same 20% that we're gonna later convert uh, to um, basically becoming debt that the company has now when it wants to redeem its own equity. The next step for us is that we're currently setting up the fundraise with Fairmint. Um, hopefully we can start the raise in two weeks. Um, we're also, uh, in the next two to three years, we're gonna put a lot of research into how do we actually make that equity conversion happen. So how do we value the company, for example? How do we value this thing? Um, and for anyone who's interested in collaborating and documenting on those approaches, uh, and the difficult questions around exactly how do we value this company, what are the tax and legal implications, or how can we generally refine this model. Or if you are interested to implement this for your own company, I'm always super open to have a conversation and figure out how this, could, might, this might work for your context. And you can uh, yeah, reach me under my email address here, ollie at memex.garden, or uh, my Twitter account, or our company's Twitter account, memexgarden. So, um, we might think that this sigmoid curve is the end. Like at that point in time, the company will not grow anymore. But I don't think this is necessarily the case. Look around yourself. These microbiomes at some point evolved with their ecosystem into cells, evolved into humans that then invented shit, that then went out and ventured and laughed and danced and do all of these things. And I think we can have the same thing for our economy too. What we need is companies that have the intrinsic motivation to regenerate what's broken in our society and at the same time uh, reward the people who actually build those economies um, with each other. So thank you so much for listening. <laughs>